So, yeah, good morning or wherever you are, whatever time zone you are in, Xenia, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, uh, it's my pleasure to address uh, the ITP under these very unusual circumstances this year. And uh, actually, I have prepared a presentation, which is coming up now, which gives you an update on the climate situation, which you referred to already. Yeah? So uh, let me start by referring to the absolute ultimate reference point, actually, whenever we talk about climate change, that is the celebrated Paris Agreement done in 2015, which says, and this is really the thing we have to have in mind, we need to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade. And actually, the IPCC uh, has uh, strengthened, in a way, the target and said we better we are better off if we limit global warming to even 1.5 degrees centigrade, and I can underpin this with a lot of scientific uh, studies. But here is the true situation now. If we look at global warming as it has developed over the last years on the left-hand panel, you see that last year, 2020, was already 1.25 degrees centigrade warmer than pre-industrial, and that actually meant that we are just a quarter of a centigrade away from the critical threshold. So this is really a very dire situation. Now we see already, we feel already the impacts of global warming. For example, last year there have been 29 tropical storms uh, accounted for in the Atlantic. That is a record number. And that has to do with the warming of the oceans. And this is really what makes me sleepless at night as a scientist, because of the extra heat the Earth absorbs due, due to the greenhouse effect, through, due to CO2 enrichment of the atmosphere. Most of the heat goes into the oceans. As you can see here, this is how the oceans uh, soak up the heat. Uh, and actually, more than 90% of the extra heat goes into the oceans, even into the deep ocean, uh, below 2,000 meters. Only 2% of, of the, the extra heat are used for warming the atmosphere, 4% actually for melting the big ice sheets. Mm -hmm. And that is actually also something we are very concerned with. This is a map of. Uh, I introduced a long time ago, actually, at Oxford University about the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. These are the vital organs of the planetary machinery, so the big ecosystems, uh, the big circulation patterns, and in particular also the big ice sheets. Uh, and what concerns us most is uh, the stability of the Greenland ice sheet, actually. And I give you just one number. You can read on the upper right side. The Greenland ice sheet lost in 2019 a record 1 million tons of ice per minute, per minute. Yeah? You have to imagine that. And if we don't stop global warming below 2 degrees, it can be an irreversible development where the Greenland ice sheet will just melt away in centuries, of course, which will provide an extra seven meter of sea level globally. Uh, just imagine what happens to the beaches of the world if you have seven meter sea level rise. Another thing of concern is the stability of the Gulf Stream, which, for example, is responsible for benign weather conditions in Europe. We have now signs that this is stopping, slowing down already because of the extra fresh water that comes from green melting. And now I show you just what will happen to the world. When we talk about destinations in tourism, what happens if the des destinations just disappear? And here I show you a map of Europe, how it would look like if all the global ice would melt down. So you see that half of England would disappear, uh, half of Germany, and so on. It's even worse if you look to the US, you see that Florida is just gone and half of Texas. But the worst impact would be in Southeast Asia, where every city you have in mind, which you may have visited uh, a few years ago, Bangkok or Ho Chi Minh City or Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, would just be gone. 
And this is something which is also very worrying that uh, because the combination of warming and uh, humidity increase in the future, according to the worst case scenarios, many parts of the tropics, you look at the lower right hand panel in dark red, would just become in uninhabitable for human beings. You could not survive if you would be outside an air-conditioned room for more than a few hours. Huh? So that's the situation. And that brings us back to the entire question. So what about global tourism in the future? Now, there has been some even perverse hope that the global pandemic, COVID-19, would reduce emissions in a way that the climate would get a break, so to speak. Unfortunately, this is not the case. We have calculated that in the first half of 2020, eight, about almost 9% of CO2 emissions were uh, reduced, actually. There was a reduction of almost 9%. Now, if you look at the entire, entire year 2020, it's already less. It's close to 6% emissions. And now you have to, uh, now you have to listen, really. Yeah? If we want to hold global warming below 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees, we would have to have this amount of emissions, close to 6%, more or less every year from now on till the middle of the century. Yeah? And the emissions now are just a result of a completely exceptional situation. Huh? And you cannot just repeat the COVID-19 situation every year. We would all yeah, become crazy and mad, actually. So you see what the scope of the transformation challenge really is. Now let me talk about uh, tourism again. This is a very important map on the left-hand side. You see how the reductions in emission came about because of the COVID measures, and you see the bulk of the reduction comes from ground transport, from aviation, from shipping, and so on. All the things which are so important for the tourism industry. Yeah? So can this be extended in the future? Not under normal circumstances. So when I, gave a, when I gave a presentation in 2019 at the ITP under normal circumstances still, well, I talked about the trends, the mega trends in aviation, for example, carbon footprint of global tourism, the increase in short haul air traveling, of course, cruise ships. Uh, now all these trends have been broken by the virus actually. Uh, the question is, what will be the new normal? Will it be a better normal, actually, which will be more sustainable, where you would try to avoid not necessary emissions from shipping, from aviation, from ground traveling, from hotel tourism, and so on? That's the big question. So I think we have been shocked by the virus into new transformational thinking. Eh? And this should be addressed, that would be my suggestion, in full, in depth, at the next convention next year, because we need a new start, a restart of the overall paradigm of tourism in this world, actually. So let me end on a silver bullet, actually. Now, we all have been accustomed to the saying, there is no silver bullet, but I think we have discovered one when it comes to climate change, actually. Yeah? And this is also relevant for hotel associations and so on. We think that the biosphere, the nature is actually our best friend in the fight against global warming. And the most important and the most relevant and actually the most uh, effective measure would be if we look at the construction, look at the construction industry, and we would actually use in the future instead of cement and steel, timber for building our houses, even skyscrapers actually, we can use them in infrastructures and so on. So turning mineral building material into organic building material actually could reduce the global emissions by 30% or something. Eh? So it's really a silver bullet. Why? Because it would not only help the climate, it would also create a much more beautiful 
environment, urban environment. And so my, my suggestion would be that each hotel planner in the world and each planner for tourist facilities should think of using timber and organic materials. This would be a true contribution to the transformation for sustainability. And last slide is actually that uh, Ursula von der Leyen, with whom I have a very good communication, uh, has picked that up and actually has uh, announced a new European Bauhaus that will focus on organic material. So thank you very much for your attention. Wow. <clears throat> thank you so much, um, Professor Schoenhuber. That was fascinating. And I'm going to pick up on that last point of creating mm. the new Bauhaus. Now, you and I, we had a discussion, I think, three years ago in Vienna about in Vienna. Mm. wood and already integrating wood. Um, it was at the beginning of, of this movement. But we had a hotelier there. He's built a beautiful wooden hotel in Munich mm. called the Soulmate Hotel. Hello to Tommy Schlered on that front, which in my mind is one of the most wonderful hotels to walk into because wood is not just, as we just saw, carbon sink. It actually gives you a great feeling as a guest. So how can we accelerate this? How can we in the hotel sector um, accelerate this adoption of wood mm. into our new projects? What can we do? If I'm sitting at a discussion around mm. a new um, development, how can I suggest, where do we get the wood from? Talk me to some yeah. of the right. steps. Yeah, well, these are the obvious question, of course, uh, because when I first started to disseminate this idea six, seven years ago, that instead of using uh, uh, steel and concrete and plastic uh, and chemistry, let's go to Mother Nature and ask her for the wonderful materials uh, that she's offering. Uh, it took evolution on this planet 500 million years to develop the tree, which is maybe the best uh, product of evolution in total, so to speak. So let's go there. And then, of course, the immediate question is, do we have enough forest? Do we have enough timber? And the answer is, actually, we have uh, an, an over offer, over support right now of, uh, of, of timber, uh, but we have to go towards uh, sustainable forestry. We have to rebuild the forest of this world anyway because of global warming. That's the irony, because yeah? it's getting hotter, drier in some places. It's getting wetter in other places. So we have to transform the, the forest of this world anyway, but we can do it in order to have all the supply we need actually to build our future cities from but from timber, actually. Yeah? So that's the one thing. But we have a win-win-win situation here. Of course, this would help the climate. We would create a huge planetary carbon sink. Yeah? So that's wonderful. But as you said, I mean, wood is a soul material. You just feel happy if you are in a timber environment, for example. It's fantastic. Uh, Firmic, so to speak, isolation properties. That's the other thing. And, and this is the most important thing, the costs have come down tremendously. Yeah? Because, you know, 20 years ago, people would have said, well, if I use steel and concrete, it's 15% cheaper than if I use timber. Now, there have been so many innovative companies who show with cross laminated timber and other new techniques that you can offer the same volume, built volume, so to speak, for a hotel or for a, just a, an ordinary one-family house, but at the same cost, actually. And I'm absolutely sure, like with you know, photovoltaics and wind energy, the costs will go down well below the current cost of concrete and steel. And then there is no reason not to use that, not to jump onto this golden opportunity, really. So it's beautiful, it will be cheap, and it helps to save the world. What's there not to like? Um, other carbon sinks, because um, some of the clients that we work with, and, and I encourage them to, especially resorts, mm. to participate in furthering projects that are other carbon sinks, such as we have a, a destination in the Caribbean where we do coral reef restoration. Oh, yeah. We've outplanted over 7,000 corals successfully. Mm. We have another uh, project that we're working with where we're restoring mangroves. As we know, mm. you know, mangroves are, again, a huge carbon sink. So talk to me about potentially other possibilities, maybe here in Europe or North America, where you can, as a tourist destination, as a resort, 
participate in, in furthering carbon sink. Mm. No, I think you have to combine more or less three things. One is, of course, you have to offer a beautiful destination. Huh? Then you should have clearly to pay attention to diversity issues. Huh? Often people say, well, if there is a forest, let's not use it. Let's put a fence around it and let's just set it aside for biodiversity. But this is true for only a very small part of the world's forest. Huh? Uh, sort of uh, primeval uh, tropical rainforest you would not touch, of course, eh? you would just protect it. But 95% of the area's uh, forests in Germany, for example, are, have been used all the time and actually will be used in the future, but you can use it in a better way. And of course, then uh, you need to be part of a uh, afforestation effort global movement in Africa, for example, in the Sahel zone, there are new technologies and new techniques to actually create forests from, from deserts, actually. Yeah. And why not uh, saying, if I'm offering you a wonderful vacation, for example, I'm offering you uh, beauty, I'm offering you uh, that you are guaranteed, that you are within the planetary boundaries, if you like. Uh, but I'm offering you also that you can volunteer to be part of a beautiful project, for example. Uh, why should we only take vacation for just hanging around uh, in boring bars or whatever and lounges? Why not becoming active as somebody who is part of saving the world again? True. And in Africa, there is already a trend to doing that conservation tourism where you go and you help right. um, protect the animals that might be poached. So this, uh, again, it's something that we encourage and it's music to my ears. I'm sure it's music to Willie's ears too. We thank you very much, Professor Dr. Sharon Hoover, for being with us, for sharing this important climate science for us in the tourism sector. And I think we've got a lot to do. Um, we can listen to your advice and we can start working on it. So we thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me.